We are very happy now to have a prime insight of the connection of politics, international diplomacy, technology, and uh, business here, which is also a tradition at DLD, to look at this angle and, and intersection. I'm very happy that Johannes Bonen, who is a co-founder with Jan Kalmorgen, together of Bonen and Kalmorgen, who is a dear, trusted friend of DLD, with a think tank, is um, setting and moderating this session. I'd like to introduce also, and he, Johannes, will introduce our three and uh, panelists to that uh, session this morning. Thank you very much and applause to all of you and have a very interesting discussion now. Thank you very much, Thank Marcel. You, Maybe, can you hear me? Can we, you hear me? Because of, uh, so good morning. Good morning and uh, welcome to this uh, session and a very warm uh, welcome also, of course, to our distinguished uh, guest. My name is Johannes Bohnen. I'm the moderator of this session. Uh, I run a public affairs uh, consultancy in Berlin and a non-profit organization that aims to strengthen transatlantic relations. And uh, of course, I'd like to introduce um, the panelists. Um, to begin with, um, to my left, you see uh, Robert Pschell. He is director of uh, the NATO Information Center Moscow since 2010. Prior to this uh, position, he served as a member of the International Secretariat at NATO headquarters um, as its press officer. Mr. Pschell previously worked as a journalist, later as a diplomat in the Polish Ministry of Foreign Affairs. So welcome to you. And right next to him uh, we see Mr. Alvaro. Uh, Alexander Alvaro is vice president of the European Parliament. He's a member of the German Liberal Party, FDP, its uh, presidency and board. He was first voted into the European Parliament as the prime candidate of the Young Liberals, called Julis, in June 2004. Alexander Alvaro studied law and also was trained as a banker. And last but not least, uh, Philip Misfelder, uh, who is a member of the German Parliament since 2005, and uh, he's the spokesperson of the Parliamentary Group on Foreign Affairs. So he has to deal with a number of wide-ranging international uh, issues. He's also the uh, head of the uh, Jung Union, the ch chairman of the Jung Union, which is the youth organization of the Christian Democratic uh, Union. So the, the topic we're discussing today is a very broad one. We have approximately 45 to 50 minutes uh, time and uh, three panelists. So I kindly ask you to uh, keep your statements uh, crisp and I also suggest that we concentrate on uh, three main themes this morning. Uh, first of all, opportunities and threats deriving from the internet and particularly the social media for um, the foreign policy of the 21st century. Uh, secondly, I like to ask the question, is social media suitable uh, to convey complex policy issues? This is the debate on widening versus deepening. And thirdly, governments as targets of political movements, uh, political campaigns. Uh, I'd like to kick off the first round uh, of discussion by quoting U.S. Secretary uh, of State Hillary Rodham Clinton, who had said, just as the Internet has changed virtually every aspect of how people worldwide live, learn, consume, and communicate, Connection technologies are changing the strategic context for diplomacy in the 21st century. So my initial question to um, all panelists is, given that we are here to discuss the changes the Internet and new technologies have brought to governments worldwide, I would like to ask you what role the Internet and specifically social media is playing for your everyday work. Uh, what has changed? What are the new challenges? Maybe. You start, Mr. Pchell. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Hannes. Uh, am I loud enough? Is it good? Can you hear me? Yeah. Well, I think, uh, first of all, many thanks to the organizers. This is a great event, and I think it's condemned to success. And um, it's also wonderful to have this, uh, feel like Madonna with this, uh, you know, wonderful little gadget. Um, Closer? Yes. Uh, I think looking at the sort of uh, the importance and the daily application of <clears throat> what is often called the web 2.0 i mean we are in moscow and this this building it's it's, it's actually a good example i mean 
October Revolution, that used to be the well-known phrase. For those who spent a few years here some years ago, Krasny uh, Aktyab, the chocolates, that was pretty well-known. There's a factory here. And then a lot of people have seen the film, probably, the hunt for direct October, and now it's a digital October. So having this neatly uh, described the evolution, uh, which uh, most of you are familiar here. Um, the thing that the most important thing to say about this digital revolution, how it affects organizations such as NATO and many others, of course, is that uh, whether we like it or not, this is, uh, this, is not, uh, this is not a fashion change. This is not a, some sort of temporary blip. It is a cultural shift. And that, uh, the figures prove that. I mean, some companies who are leading uh, in this uh, leading uh, this revolution who are now approaching one billion subscribers uh, they are only to my best knowledge there are only three countries in the world which censor YouTube that's well China Turkmenistan and, uh, and Sudan uh, but the point is that everybody is connected and what it really means in practical terms and in political and in social terms is that the days where you just uh, you know, upload it and then possibly expected somebody to download it are uh, long gone. This is about uploading, downloading, and back and forth. You know, so again, that's proven one of the big heroes of the October Revolution, Mr. Trotsky, wrong because you recall he said that his idea of running a foreign policy shop was to issue a few proclamations and close down the shop. These days are gone. That's why, um, you know, Organizations like NATO, we have for the first time the Secretary General who has a Facebook account, who has a Twitter account, and he does use it. Uh, he uses it to, uh, you know, uh, share his observations on whatever, the Chicago summit, but also to, uh, for instance, on his uh, video blog to show that he really enjoyed the jogging experience. He did it after the jogging in Moscow when he first came here. He jogged in <laughs> Chicago. But, you know, at the days when even the Pope uses the Twitter, I mean, if the Pope uses the Twitter, I think those who don't, uh, they have to think twice because that means they are not connected. There's also some fascinating anecdotal evidence. For example, a couple of years ago in a small village in Kenya, which is really very far away from uh, big, let's say, um, big cities, um, the chief of that village, so to speak, had tweeted at 4 o'clock in the morning that somebody was trying to break into the main building in that village. And in a space of half an hour, the villagers came and actually grabbed their robbers. Now, that is impressive. That is the world in which we live in. And we have to, of course, uh, be part of this. Um, I mentioned the feedback. This is extremely important because, of course, uh, not just international organizations, but all the other structures have a particular problem with the feedback. Because social media, as the name suggests, I mean, they are meant for people. I mean, you, you want to actually, you want to, yeah see some real people respond to the questions. Well, in organizations, usually you have some bureaucrats. Having said this, this is just a challenge, and it cannot be an excuse for not doing this. So uh, this is, I'll just show you from afar. These are the types of things that we do, NATO TV, uh, YouTube, and so on. And I'm sure others do the same. I'll pass the baton to the next speaker. Thank you. So basically, answering to the same question, um, well, I, I believe the development is, is incredible. It's not just an evolution. From the day when Tim Berners-Lee invented the World Wide Web to today, we've seen three major developments, I believe, starting with the classical internet in terms of e-commerce, which has mounted up today to a total yearly revenue of around eight trillion US dollars. Uh, one has to imagine how much that actually is compared to the general traffic uh, which we have in terms of commerce within the world. So that is certainly one development. But of course, one of the challenges is where you have the upsides, you also have the downsides. Compared to eight trillion of total yearly revenue in e-commerce and turnover, we actually see 388 billion um, of money which has sort of been developed in the area of cybercrime, um, which is actually more than the worldwide combined revenue of heroin, cocaine, and marijuana traffic. So on the other hand, we do see that there's also the efforts or the effects we see in the real world, we somehow see mirrored, of course, in a virtual world, though there, cybercrime are other issues. Secondly, when the next leap came, social development, social media, we see 
um, Facebook, for example, as a social media company, but others um, having around 900 uh, million users now, closely mounting up to about 1 billion, bringing them in the league of the largest nations of the world. So the question one day will be not only what citizenship you have, but probably also what netizenship you will have. Where are you located? How will your real life be influenced by the social platforms you're moving on? From there over, we saw the spreading into politics, and that's something we have to deal with, actually, is how do we make use of the Internet to support democracy, transparency, and participation throughout the world? Probably one of the biggest challenges politics have, because it is usually in big institutions like the European Parliament, the European Commission, or the Council, that developments are more slower, of course, than in the economic sphere. So people in my surrounding probably will have to learn that digital participation doesn't mean you just post a press release. It means that you have to engage, that you have to discuss, that you give feedback if people ask you something. And our developments are going clearly in that direction. We are preparing the 2014 elections of the European Parliament already. The question is how do we communicate better with citizens? How do we actually show what we're doing? How do we open our black box and give an inside look? And not only that, how do we allow people to bring their ideas forward, to participate in political developments? One of the efforts we're undertaking right now is to set up within our communications unit a clearly a trend analysis branch, which actually has a look at microblogs, social platforms like Twitter or others. What is communicated with citizens? What are they talking about? What are the topics which they're interested in? Are we actually online with what people expect from us to do? And to learn out of that and to develop politics, that is actually going to be the big, big challenge. It will show us that politics' role, in my personal opinion, will change very much in the next five years. It will be, of course, giving ideas taking a lead, but more and more moderating citizens' interests than it has before. And I must admit, I wouldn't be able to predict where the web goes. If I would have to quote somebody, I probably would quote Eric Schmidt from Google, um, who was in the European Parliament a couple of weeks ago. I said, be sure the internet will be local, mobile, and social. And that is something we will have to adapt as politicians to at the same time. We will have to see that the challenges arising are tremendous because one thing we have to make sure that even in democracy the tyranny of masses which has once been described by shitstorms you might face in Twitter or other medias if you address issues which are not too popular that is something how we'll have to deal with how do we counter this how do we explain better what we're doing but I believe in this panel we will come to the question how can we actually do better in social media how can we actually deepen the discussions instead of just spreading what we're trying to do. Thank you, Johannes. Uh, I would like to continue on the last point of Alexander because um, um, regarded to, um, related to foreign policy issues, um, the question is um, that we have an existing phenomenon that social media and also other websites like WikiLeaks have an enormous impact on uh, foreign policy. <clears throat> so even a country like America is um, is the political system is um, completely shaken up by by the um, uh, by WikiLeaks and it has had a massive impact on the daily work of every diplomat uh, around the world for America for the United States and um, social media never had a, such an important important role uh, like it was in the Arab Spring but the question is um, how sustainable these developments are and uh, what, is the, what is the process uh, where the politicians are really engaged and um, to, put, uh, to have more participation for, the, uh, for these people who use these media and uh, what will be the, the follow-up of these new developments because I was in Tunisia last week and I and I saw, of course, what's happened at the end of 2010, and um, this, uh, the, the start of the Arab Revolution in um, in Tunisia began also driven by social media, because the the coverage of the traditional media in in Tunisia was dominated by uh, Ben Ali's people, but uh, it, it was spread, all the information, all the criticism was spread around the country and around the world um, by, by social media. And it was extremely interesting for us to see how 
this impact uh, has also a political influence. It started with only one event and uh, had a great political impact. But the problem right now is um, the follow-up. So the people are once very, uh, very emotional on Twitter and Facebook, and they are active activists. They start to demonstrate. They want to participate. But now everything is as it was before. Um, not with Ben Ali's people, but El Nachta now. It, uh, the people from El Nachta are not necessarily these young people who uh, demonstrated against Ben Ali and started the Arab Revolution. And this is also the case in, in Egypt, where a lot of young people are completely disappointed with the system again. They went, uh, they went home, they are active in their private lives, they have their um, own private challenges again, but they are not, uh, there is no process led by the internet. And this is where I agree with uh, Alexander that um, politi politicians and even parties uh, have to um, have to react on this and have to uh, use this chance from the internet um, for their program and has to organize the follow-up pro um, process, which is not so emotional, I guess, uh, like the beginning and the, the kickoff of all these developments, but it much more, it, there is a chance that it is much more sustainable and therefore you need the, uh, you need the intellectual basis for, um, for this dialogue. And um, this is also a challenge for think tanks like uh, yours, Johannes. Thank you very much for the first round. Um, I forgot to mention that um, Arkady Dvorkovic, uh, who's the deputy premier to the Russian uh, government, couldn't make it this morning. So we're lacking the Russian perspective. And I can only uh, ask you to step in if you have any contributions to make, any questions to ask, and also see the former um, ambassador of Russia to Germany, Mr. Kostinev. Very warm welcome to you as well. Um, uh, and since we have answered in the initial first round already some uh, questions regarding to threats and opportunities, I'd like to skip the, what I had envisioned as the second round and come directly um, to another topic. It seems that technology does not always equal modernization and progress. And uh, I'm sure that many of you have heard about this viral video, Kony 2012. Um, I think it's a good example for hurdles the internet advocacy is facing. Um, um, the video was created by the NGO Invisible Children and aimed at raising global awareness about the crimes the Ugandan dictator uh, has committed. Uh, while some were stunned by the rapid spread of the video, uh, others criticized the lack of background information which did not live up to the complexity of issues Central Africa has to deal with. So I'm referring here to the debate of widening versus deepening. So how much substance is there in our debates on foreign policy? It appears that social media work well for awareness raising through uh, emotional cues, uh, but especially with regard to complex policy issues, um, it seems to be a tough task to create a sustainable debate on the internet. To exaggerate how Complex can the debate become, become if the length of an argument is limited to 140 characters, one tweet. Um, uh, and Mr. Alvarez, maybe I would like to address you in this regard because I've seen on your website that you're interacting directly with your constituency um, and um, you are asking citizens for their input and their feedback to concrete governmental initiatives. What is your impression on the used format. What is uh, your experience here? Can everyday citizens provide valuable insights to complex foreign policy issues? Well, of course, of course they can. Um, the question is just, will they? Um, be, because what we've seen so far is, uh, and, and or let me start this way, we, we did develop a tool which is very closely linked to a wiki or whatever, but I'm not a software engineer and, and especially not a web designer, so, so we're actually happy it's running. It doesn't look too neat, but it's running. Um, is that we upload uh, legislative initiatives and uh, we give the possibility to actually put forward amendments uh, to that legislative initiative the way in a parliamentary format it had to be done. Um, so, so what we can do basically is give the offer. We can guarantee that we monitor it, that we um, explain why we would take up initiative, why not. We would put it forward to committee, let's see if it goes to plenary and so on. So this is where we actually as politicians could give an offer. Um, though I cannot force anybody to participate, what we often see in 
in an online environment is that, as you mentioned, in the initial sort of uproar of an issue, you have tremendously amounts of tweets coming in saying, how can this be, and, and, and this has to be changed, and this has to be done. But then when it comes actually to the nitty-gritty work, working on details, um, we see something we actually see everywhere in society, in the online and offline world, and even inside political parties, that when it comes to the tough core work, it's usually the experts or the ones seriously interested dealing with those issues. So you might then find out of probably 100 who express certain views, in the end you're lucky if you find 10 who will work in depth on that mm -hmm. issue. So. I am not too sure if social media itself can provide platforms where this in-depth work can be done. We've seen different formats like wikis or others where you have experts dealing with certain topics. But again, they are experts. It becomes in a way exclusive because a lot of people are lost in these discussions. So what I actually would like to see is that an initial discussion is started on social media, then politics takes it up with civil society and the experts outside of politics and starts to work in, in depth on those. And then we might find also formats online which can support that. But interesting enough, I've never, for example, seen a flash mob which had the purpose to have a discussion. So um, this is, uh, I, I'm a little bit doubtful how this will be how this will develop but again um, nobody I believe can dare to play the Oracle of Delphi on questions of internet development six seven years ago nobody would have heard about Facebook right and after all um, Facebook Twitter YouTube are just new communication channels uh, but there's the danger and I'd like to ask this question uh, mr. Ms. Velle, um that this might be a very superficial debate and you know, the, uh, particularly when we talk about the, new, uh, the younger generation, there's only a very short attention uh, span. How can we generate political um, solutions today um, via the internet? Uh, how can we um, make progress here? Do we need more creativity? Do we have to work on pro uh, processes and new methods, new tools? What's the challenge there according to, to you? What do you think? I think, it, uh, I think it was mentioned earlier that uh, it's not enough to publish uh, your, your press statements on, on the website. You have to, uh, to use every tool and, uh, and the most important thing that you have to be available uh, nearly uh, as a party or as a, as a club in the Bundestag, you have to be available for 24 hours because people expect that you react quickly. Yep. And this is not only uh, important in the campaigns, it's um, also important when you are discussing questions because sometimes uh, for, uh, for several reasons you have developments like the ACTA uh, or SOPRA uh, debate. It's, uh, it was discussed over months and it was also transparent yep. but it was in comparison to other laws um, uh, they are discussed in parliament or in governments. Um, but it was, uh, but it started in the internet. It was a mass movement. For the first time, we had in Germany this uh, uh, an event and, and a, a social media-driven demonstration. Not only for 200, 400 people. For I guess it was 40,000 people demonstrated against ACTA. This is uh, this is crazy. Uh, when you when you compare it to mm -hmm. the um, political priority list because it was number 100 or something like this, and it changed it completely. And the reason for that was our communication mistake in general of all the people who are involved in this question, that we, uh, that we haven't monitored uh, what was going on on the weekend, because usually um, politicians are in, in Germany are working with the new, newspapers and TV, and uh, some uh, press officers missed uh, the, the developments Absolutely. going on on the weekend. And that's was the reason that uh, ACTA became so dangerous for, for the political debate. And in addition to what was also uh, already mentioned, a flash mob and a, a, shit, uh, a shit storm is not a part of discussion. It's only criticism. And it's not, it's not substantial. And this is, of course, you can test issues and you can see uh, how the people like it or dislike it, but it's not, but it's not a part of, the, of a democracy. I, I don't think that we are in the this, in this stage where you can really mention this at, in, at a part of a democ a democratic uh, dialogue, uh, which is much more necessary, because it's not enough to criticize something. It's also enough to react on uh, with alternatives, because there is a need for all this le le uh, legislation. Absolutely. 
Um, modern communication tools have um, led to international, to the spectacular success of the internet, but also to its troubling vulnerability to attack. And I'd like to talk a little bit uh, about uh, the question of cyber insecurity, uh, because there's this uh, paradox of freedom uh, in con and control. We have said already that the internet and the social media widens the debate, makes it sometimes uh, a little bit more superficial. Um, and the drawbacks are often um, a uh, superficial debate and cyber insecurity. So, Mr. Pschell, uh, as representative of NATO, uh, what do you think is the most promising approach to fight cyber crime? Uh, should an international organization like NATO be at the forefront of fighting this, or is it uh, up to um, single nation states? Thank you. First of all, I, I fully agree with the observations of uh, Philip and uh, yes, Alexander, because indeed it's, <laughs> this is the, the new world. It may be imperfect, uh, because it is, but, but it, it, what it does, it empowers people. It's, uh, you know, the, as somebody put it, if you compare the international relations or even domestic politics to the chessboard, then, you know, pawns become queens. You know, and that means we, uh, the, the rules of the game really change. It's, it's all about interactivity. But of course, there are all those wonderful benefits from having the, the global, the, the digital revolution, all the access and the possibility to use uh, the instruments. But of course, then there are some, let's call them bad guys, who want to use that for their own ends, be they criminals, be they terrorists, sometimes it may be even governments. And of course, you need to be able to protect it. That is, if I may make a pitch for my organization, that is part of what we try to do. I mean, we try to play a role. Let me make it crystal clear. Uh, the only way to address the security threats to internet, uh, to uh, other platforms, is of course via cooperation. Because you, know, you need the experience and the solutions of the business world. Yes, at NATO, for a variety of historic reasons, it was the military technology was at the, at the forefront uh, of uh, available, uh, if you like, uh, defenses. So we have worked on that. We have developed a cyber defense policy, but it's not just about responding. We do have what we call a fire brigade type of a team composed of um, experts from allies which can help any country in distress. And this goes just about protecting the closed information systems, but also the, about the protection of the open cyberspace. Because if you have a country like Estonia, which comes under attack, essentially it's a security threat in a full sense of the world, something which was not even considered some years ago. So you have to be able to sort of um, protect it in a, in a sort of fire brigade f form, and you need international cooperation with that. But you need to do a lot of work in advance. You need to raise the awareness of the people who use it, because you know, essentially the system is just as good as the weakest link in it. You know? uh, and the last point is, of course, you need to always try to be ahead of the bad guys. So again, to make a pitch for NATO, uh, we have set up a so-called Center of Excellence for Cyber Defense, where there's a lot of thinking going on. Uh, and we hope to do that thinking uh, together with uh, as many partners as possible. Because once again, uh, to use the Estonian example, uh, our estimate is in during those attacks a few years ago, the cyberspace of more than half of the allied countries was used. Not, of course, with the, with the agreement of the government. So, it's, uh, it's a brave new world, it has wonderful ch uh, opportunities, and we all want to use them, but at the same time, uh, making sure that we can in involves work on, on protecting that cyberspace. So that's something which should be taken very seriously, and frankly speaking, a lot of effort and money should be spent on it, and not just by, by the big companies, but also uh, by the governments, because I think it's in the benefit of everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. If, if I may, just, just let me very, very short comment on, on what you asked before, because uh, I believe in terms of what, what Philip was talking about, uh, of reactions and, and flash mobs and, and shit storms. Um, I, I'm quite happy that you actually have this Twitter feed here. It's a little bit too small from read to read here, and unfortunately the one who mentioned was already gone, but there was one comment in terms of it's a fruitless uh, backward orientated politic discussion going on, uh, which is, thank you for your comment, I mean, it's good to know, but it would be even better to figure out what would one expect from us. I mean, because to believe 
that politicians basically have an answer to everything, something we might be good in pretending it's not actually the truth, especially not in a complex world like today. So if there are any ideas how actually politics can better communicate with citizens using social media, that would be nice as an added comment to the fruitless uh, debate. So, so maybe some fruit would help uh, in that term. On the question of cybersecurity, um, I do believe uh, it's, it's, it's a borderless threat and, and countries have to react that way. We have to understand to cooperate. We have to share information, always difficult for countries to do so. We have to cooperate in structures. And, and uh, for example, NATO has set up and developed very, very well the Talent Cybersecurity Center. And I believe there was a lot of knowledge gained out of the attacks uh, Estonia was, was uh, threatened with and which had a very, very high social impact into the country. Um, I personally believe now having it from our perspective at the European Union, it doesn't make sense if 27 member states build up their own cyber defense strategies, if NATO builds up their own cyber defense strategies, if the European Union builds their own up, and if the Council of Europe builds on its own cyber strategy up. We have to interlink these initiatives. We have to see how we can work together with the excellences we have. And adding to the awareness point, of course we have to explain to our citizens that it does make sense to have minimal security issues on your computer, like a firewall, a virus scanner, or other things like these, which is sort of the ABC of internet behavior. I mean, nobody would doubt nowadays that whenever you step into a car and hit the highway that you buckle up. The interesting thing is the moment you enter the data highway, you don't buckle up. And the threats are certainly similar to real threats when you see that what you actually mentioned in terms of attacks, that computers are used as zombies by by criminals, and most people are not even aware that their computer is used, but of course it's easy to intrude if there are no protection mechanisms. We have to see that there's quite a cat and mouse race uh, when it comes to the question about cyber defense and cyber criminality. One step forward would be that citizens' awareness is as high as in the real world when taking care of themselves and of the technologies they're using. But again, the key issue will be to cooperate, to work together, interlink, and use the synergies we have. Only one uh, very brief um, statement to um, cyber secu security and for um, foreign policy. I, I think the right place to, to organize it is NATO. Uh, we are always discussing what should be the new ray for, role for NATO, but there is a big need for um, a great um, investment um, for, uh, of, of money for uh, cyber security protection and even for reaction, because it's, it's a political unsolved question, how should we react on a cyber attack? Um, do we have an option for a second strike, or um, are we prepared for something like this? Do we know where a strike is coming from, who is the one who is attacking us. Um, remember the, the, the Iranian issue, um, it's, it's the most effective thing to, uh, to stop the Iranian government right now. It's not diplomacy, it's not military, it's, uh, it was Stuxnet. And, it's, um, and the question is what happens to us if someone from outside or inside um, it may be a high school uh, boy who is crazy. It may be a uh, an government from Far East. You never know who it is, um, who is attacking our energy uh, sector or our banking sector. And what is, the, wh what is the option to strike back for this? And this is, I guess, it's one of the big challenges also for NATO and for uh, military commanders, uh, how you can organize security in a connected world where the internet is um, connecting our life so much um, that it is a big need to protect our citizens for um, these attacks from outside, perhaps, or inside. Just a brief response, please. Just, just a brief response. What you, I believe, can do, I mean, first of all, I believe the protection issue, before you might think about a strike back, and then how do you actually react? I mean, we've seen that actually the U.S. government, when uh, seeing websites of Al-Qaeda in Yemen, decided not to attack them in the way to take them down, but basically to alternate the content, informing how many civil casualties there were with attacks of Al-Qaeda in Yemen. The interesting reaction by Al-Qaeda at that point was to say, don't believe everything you read on the internet. Okay. 
Thank you very much. I just saw we have only seven more minutes to go, and I think it would be a good opportunity to bring in the Russian perspective. So maybe you have any comments or uh, questions, and I see the, uh, again, the former ambassador to Germany here. Uh, ambassador, maybe I can ask you directly a question. Do you, uh, do you think it's fair to say that without the growing number of bloggers uh, in Russia and the thousands of followers who back these uh, bloggers, President Medvedev, and Prime Minister Putin would not have agreed to meet them and discuss the state of democracy in Russia? Uh, I, I think uh, we had some meetings of uh, our leaders with bloggers, and uh, I, I'm sure uh, they will do it uh, uh, often. Open. Yeah, often and, and, and uh, often. And uh, uh, I do not see the... the uh, danger here, but uh, I, I agree with the uh, uh, participants of this channel, uh, of this panel, sorry. Uh, uh, it's uh, the, the internet, social nets, it's not only uh, the possibilities, first of all, for politicians, but a great responsibility of all participants of this nets. Thank you very much. Anybody else who would like to ask a question, make a comment? Yeah, please. And identify yourself. Present yourself to the DLD community. Yes. I am Yelena Kolmanovska from Yandex. But my question is not connected with Yandex. So I would, uh, my question consists of two parts. And I would like to know the, the general ideas about, I'd like to know how your, uh, your commu commuters and so on can help in everyday life. So there are two stories. One story is that, for example, in Russia, we have almost no laws about internet. So we don't have DMCA. We, we don't have any laws about which sites must be forbidden. But uh, the problem is that uh, when uh, the site happens in Russia, there are some tools in the site. The site is about phishing or dangerous with viruses. Uh, our policy, our government is able to do something when the same site is abroad. So it's always very complicated to connect with people who host this site and different countries have different, different laws. So I would like to know if you have any ideas about how internet is international, internet has no borders. So what, what, what are the ideas how every people can help each other, governments can help each other, and not because there are things which nobody wants to support, like viruses and so on, is the first part of the question. And the second part of the question is that very usual, I see how the questions of security are used in political, uh, in political uh, purposes. For example, somebody says, oh, Russia is the country of hackers. You know, the most dangerous hackers live in Russia. Or any site which wants to attract the attention of mass media can say, I said something very political, and after this I was DDoSed. I had a DDoS attack. And uh, the second question is how to differ from the, the real danger from political one. How not to let, because I guess you are a specialist in real security. You are not a political person who, are, who wants to play this game. So how to differ the real situation from the political situation? Yeah, thank you. Maybe uh, Mr. Pschell from, from NATO tr tries to answer the, the second question. And we start that way. Okay, I'll, I, indeed, I'll, I'll be happy to leave the, the legal aspects because I think that's more, we have two parliamentarians here. Uh, NATO doesn't really deal that we, we sort of give some thought, but it's not for us. It, the security aspect, you know, there are some real dilemmas, of course. We all want, and I think everybody in this room wants to keep uh, the website and all the platforms free. That's, that's the beauty of them. Uh, you know, we've seen some uh, people in the, during the Arab Spring uh, say that this is, this is like Wikipedia. Everybody brings uh, their own input into the revolution or whatever they want to call it. Uh, there are, you know, things we just got used to and we don't want to change it. You know, so in that sense, one has to be very careful in, in, <laughs> in establishing some sort of, you know, uh, some marginal lines, you know, to that. But having said this, all those aspects of, uh, you know, security in a way, you know, the way we look at it is we look at cyber defense where the question of where do the attacks, where do the spoilers come from, is, is of secondary importance. 
You know, that's something for, let's say, <laughs> for further debate or for, for, for other. But the main thing is to construct systems to have the, the awareness, the international cooperation, to be able to protect. It's like, you know, um, common space. I mean, we all want to have the seas. That's why we have an international coalition fighting pirates. You know, you could say it's a bit of hodgepodge coalition, but we have some success. You know, uh, if you want to have, you know, free space exploration, the same. So we are talking about something very fundamental, and I think I, I'm not sure about, you know, how, how is it possible. Look at the issue um, to legislate everything or agree on everything. Look at the issue of terrorism, which we've dealt many years. United Nations has spent more than 20 years trying to come up with a definition of terrorism, and they have not succeeded. But we all know what terrorism is. You know, if they strike in the metro at Domodedovo or New York, we know that's terrorism, huh? and we, you know, we have to work together. So I kind of, I think we need to have a bit of trust in our collective ability. And frankly, when we have questions, ask the question. The Twitter will answer very quickly. The Facebook people will answer very quickly, and they'll use the platforms that uh, your organization, your company represents. So um, there is work to be done, but I, I, I think we, we can do it, and creative solutions will have to be fun. But we have to be agile, we have to be quick, and we have to be uh, creative. Well, just very briefly, because we have to stop. Okay, okay, okay. On, on, on the legal matters, I, I basically, first of all, it might be a a new fact, but what is forbidden offline actually is also forbidden online. So, so, so the question is just how do one enforce it? I believe a lot of mutual legal assistance is important. There has to be a common acknowledgement and agreement worldwide what is right, what is wrong. The European Union has a lot of legislation on those issues. Again, the question is how is it enforced? Um, but basically, it might be time for a global internet charta of rights. No, I fully agree. It's, um, it's, not, a, it's not a question of uh, values. It's only a technical question how we should uh, bring our um, values from the uh, f um, former world to, to this new Internet world. It's not a question where we should debate our law system in a new role. Thank you for that discussion I saw there. Thank you. Give an applause to our, our panelists and our moderator, Johannes.